This sound file contains the spoken version of a Wikipedia article on the Scholes and Glidden typewriter recorded by user Camshaft64. The material recorded is current as of the 19th of July, 2021. Scholes and Glidden typewriter from Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia at en.wikipedia.org. The Scholes and Glidden typewriter also known as the Remington No. 1, was the first commercially successful typewriter. Principally designed by the American inventor Christopher Langtham Scholes, it was developed with the assistance of fellow printer Samuel W. Soule and amateur mechanic Carlos S. Glidden. Work began in 1867, but Soule left the enterprise shortly thereafter, replaced by James Densmore who provided financial backing and the driving force behind the machine's continued development. After several short-lived attempts to manufacture the device, the machine was acquired by E. Remington Sons in early 1873. An arms manufacturer seeking to diversify, Remington further refined the typewriter before finally placing it on the market on July 1, 1874. During its development, the typewriter evolved from a crude curiosity into a practical device, the basic form of which became the industry standard. The machine incorporated elements which became fundamental to typewriter design, including a cylindrical platen and a four-row QWERTY keyboard. Several design deficiencies remained, however. The Scholes and Glidden could print only uppercase letters, an issue remedied by its successor, the Remington No. 2, and was a blind writer meaning the typist could not see what was being written as it was entered. Initially, the typewriter received an unenthusiastic reception from the public. Lack of an established market, high cost, and the need for trained operators slowed its adoption. Additionally, the recipients of typewritten messages found the mechanical, all uppercase of writing to be impersonal and even insulting. The new communication technologies and expanding businesses of the late 19th century, however, had created a need for expedient, legible correspondence, and so the Scholes and Glidden and its contemporaries soon became common office fixtures. The typewriter is credited with assisting the entrance of women into the clerical workplace, as many were hired to operate the new devices. The introduction to the article contains a photo with the caption, the Scholes and Glidden typewriter, as produced by E. Remington and Sons. The article contains nine sections. These sections are Section 1. History Section 1.1. Early Development Section 1.2. Refinement Section 1.3. Start of an Industry Section 2. Design Section 2.1. QWERTY Keyboard Section 3. Reception and Legacy Section 3.1. Women in the Typewriter, Section 4, See Also, Section 5, Notes, Section 6, References, Section 7, Bibliography, Section 8, Further Reading, and finally, Section 9, External Links. This concludes the Table of Contents. Section 1, History. Section 1.1, Early Development. The Scholes and Glidden Typewriter had its origin in a printing machine designed in 1866 by Christopher Latham Scholes to assist in printing page numbers in books and serial numbers on tickets and other items. Scholes, a Wisconsin printer, formed a partnership with Samuel W. Soule, also a printer, and together they began development work in Charles F. Kleinstuber's machine shop, a converted mill in northern Milwaukee. Carlos S. Glidden, an inventor who frequented the machine shop, became interested in the device and suggested that it might be adapted to print alphabetical characters as well. In June 1867, Glidden read an article in Scientific American describing the Patero type, a writing machine invented by John Jonathan Pratt and recently featured in an issue of London Engineering. Glidden showed the article to Scholes, who thought the machine was, quote, complicated and liable to get out of order, end quote, and was convinced that a better machine could be designed. To that point, several dozen patents for printing devices have been issued in the United States and abroad. None of the machines, however, 
had been successful or effective products. In November 1866, following their successful collaboration on the numbering machine, Scholz asked Sol to join him and Glidden in developing the new device. Matthias Schwalbach, a German clockmaker, was hired to assist with construction. To test the proposed machine's feasibility, a key was taken from a telegraph machine and modified to print the letter W. By September 1867, a model with a full alphabet, numbers, and rudimentary punctuation had been completed, and it was used to compose letters to acquaintances in the hopes of selling the invention, or procuring funds for its manufacture. One recipient, James Denmore, immediately bought a 25% interest for $600, the cost of the machine's development to that day. Densmore saw the machine for the first time in March 1868 and was unimpressed. He thought it clumsy and impractical and declared it, quote, good for nothing except to show that its underlying principles were sound, end quote. Among other deficiencies, the device held paper in a horizontal frame, which limited the thickness of the paper that could be used and made alignment difficult. A patent for the typewriter was granted on June 23, 1868, and, despite the device's flaws, Densmore rented a building in Chicago in which to begin its manufacture. Fifteen units were produced before a lack of funds forced the venture back to Milwaukee. This subsection is accompanied by a patent with the caption, The machine patented on June 23, 1868 resembled a, quote, a cross between a piano and a kitchen table, end quote. Section 1.2, Refinement. During 1869, an improved model was designed, which, unlike the previous version, drew upon work done by other inventors. A machine patented in 1833 by Charles Thurber, for example, used a cylindrical platen. Scholz adapted the idea and implemented a rotating drum to which the paper was clipped, replacing the frame of the previous model. Sol and Glidden did not assist development of the new platen, and, as their interest in the venture was waning, sold their rights to the original machine to Scholz and Densmore. Prototypes were sent to professionals in various fields, including James O. Cleffin, a stenographer whose heavy use destroyed several machines. Cleffin's feedback, although caustic, led to the development of an additional 25 to 30 prototypes, each an improvement on its predecessor. In summer 1870, Densmore traveled to New York to demonstrate the machine to Western Union, which was looking for a method to record telegrams. Western Union ordered several machines, but declined to purchase the rights, as it believed a superior device could be developed for less than Densmore's asking price of $50,000. To supply the orders and to repay debts, Densmore began to manufacture the machines in summer 1871. During this time, the machine was revised to improve durability and the platen was designed after feedback from Western Union, which wanted the ability to print on a continuous roll, indicated that clipping paper to the platen was impractical. The new design, however, infringed on a patent granted to Charles A. Washburn in November 1870. Washburn consequently received royalties on further production. In 1872, to manufacture the new machine in earnest, a former wheelwright shop was secured along with several employees. Although the machine works well, the lack of economies of scale prevented the venture from yielding a profit. In exchange for funding the ventures, Densmore had been acquiring an ever-increasing ownership interest. Scholz was eventually bought out for a cash payment of $12,000. Glidden kept his one-tenth right of the patent. Densmore consulted with George W. N. Yost, a manufacturer with whom he had been acquainted, and who suggested showing the machine to E. Remington & Sons. Remington, an arms manufacturer seeking to diversify after the Civil War, possessed the machining equipment and skilled machinists necessary to further develop the complex machine. A typewritten letter was sent to Remington, where executive Henry H. Benedict was impressed by the novelty and encouraged company president Philo Remington to pursue the device. This subsection is accompanied by a black and white photo captioned E. Remington & Sons Factory in Ilion, New York, circa 1874. Section 1.3, Start of an Industry. Following a demonstration at Remington's offices in New York, the company contracted on March 1st, 1873, 
to manufacture 1,000 machines, with the option to produce an additional 24,000. Although the agreement required Densmore to give Remington $10,000 and royalty rights, a marketing firm to be formed by Densmore and Yoast was allowed to serve as the exclusive sales agent. Remington dedicated a wing of its factory to the typewriter and spent several months retooling and re-engineering the device. Production began in September, and the machine entered the market on July 1, 1874. Typewriter production was largely overseen by Jefferson Clough and William K. Jen, manager of Remington's sewing machine division. The redesigned machine was sturdier and more reliable than Scholl's model, but had taken some of the characteristics of a sewing machine, including a japanned case with floral ornamentation and a stand with a treadle to operate the carriage return. The typewriter, however, had been rushed into production with insufficient testing, and early models were soon returned for adjustments and repair. By December 1874, only 400 typewriters had been sold, due in part to their high price and poor reliability. As businesses were slow to adopt the machine, authors, clergymen, lawyers, and newspaper editors were the target customers. Individuals, however, generally did not write enough to justify the machine's price of about $125, the average annual income per person at the time. There were exceptions, however. Mark Twain was among the first to purchase the machine, which he termed a curiosity-breeding little joker. Although the machine was exhibited at the Centennial Exhibition in 1876, it was overshadowed by Alexander Graham Bell's telephone. Several design and manufacturing improvements followed, including replacing the treadle with a hand lever, and 4,000 machines had been sold by 1877. In 1878, Remington outsourced marketing to E&T Fairbanks & Company, a scale manufacturer, as marketing to that point had only provided lackluster sales. An improved model, the Remington No. 2, was also introduced in 1878. The new machine was able to type upper and lowercase characters, thus remedying a significant drawback of its predecessor. As the only typewriter manufacturer, Remington maintained a monopoly position until the American Writing Machine Company introduced typewriter to compete with the Remington machines in 1881. In response to the new competition, Remington lowered the price of the Scholes and Glidden referred to in sales literature as the Remington No. 1, to $80, and negotiated an agreement with the marketing firm Wyckoff, Siemens, and Benedict to take all the machines produced. The arrangement marked the beginning of the typewriter's commercial success, as the agent's marketing prowess led to the sale of 1,200 machines in its first year. By 1884, more competitors had appeared, including the Hammond Typewriter Company, the Crandall Typewriter Company, and the Hall Typewriter Company. In the decades since the introduction of the Scholes and Glidden, a thriving typewriter industry had developed. This subsection contains a photo of the Scholes and Glidden typewriter with the caption, A redesign incorporated floral ornamentation, a characteristic from Remington's sewing machine division. Section 2. Design. The Scholes and Glidden typewriter incorporated several components adapted from existing devices, such as escapement, a mechanism governing carriage movement, adapted from clockwork, keys adapted from telegraph machines and type hammers adapted from the piano. In developing the first model, however, Scholes and Sol had not investigated printing machines created by other inventors and consequently developed several poor designs which could have been avoided. The failure to research earlier designs also led to the reinvention of features which had already been developed. Sol, for example, suggested a circular type bar orientation. A circular arrangement had already been used for more than 30 years earlier in a machine designed by Xavier Progen in 1833. In the machine's original 1868 design, paper was placed horizontally on the top of the machine, held in place by a movable square frame, to provide line and letter spacing. Above the paper and centered on the device, an arm held an inked ribbon which crossed over a small metal plate. Depressing a key caused a type bar to rise from underneath the paper pressing the paper upwards against the ribbon and thus printing an inked character. This method of imprinting required use of very thin, non-standard paper, such as tissue paper. Two variants were produced with alternative methods of actuating the type bars, one in which the keys and type bars were connected by a series of wires, and one in which the keys directly kicked the type bar upwards.
The arm and frame components were replaced with a cylindrical platen in 1869. Unlike modern typewriters, the revised machine entered letters around the cylinder, with axial rotation providing letter spacing and horizontal shifting providing line spacing. Paper was clipped directly to the cylinder, which limited its length and width to the dimensions of the apparatus. The platen was again redesigned in early 1872 to allow the use of paper of any length. The redesigned platen also introduced the modern spacing functionality. Horizontal and axial movement provided letter and line spacing respectively. The cylindrical platen became, quote, an indispensable part of every standard typewriter, end quote. By the end of 1872, the appearance and function of the typewriter had assumed the form which would become standard in the industry and remain largely unchanged for the next century. Although the machine possessed a cylindrical platen and what was essentially a QWERTY keyboard, two design elements that would later become essential were lacking. The ability to write in upper and lowercase letters and quote-unquote visible print. Although the former was implemented in the Remington No. 2, the machine was fundamentally an upstrike design, meaning the type bars struck upwards against the underside of the platen. As this occurred inside the machine, the operator could not see what was being entered as it was typed. Although competing brands such as the Oliver and Underwood began to market visible typewriters in the 1890s, a Remington branded model did not appear until the Remington number 10 in 1906. The first part of the section contains two images. The first is a diagram with the caption, quote, one variant of the Scholes and Glidden typewriter used wires and levers to connect the key and type bars. The second image is captioned, quote, by the end of 1872, the typewriter had taken an appearance similar to that of a modern typewriter. Section 2.1, QWERTY keyboard. The QWERTY keyboard, so named for the first six characters of the uppermost alphabetic row, was invented during the course of the typewriter's development. The first model constructed by Schulz used a piano-like keyboard with two rows of characters arranged alphabetically as follows. The article now contains two rows of characters that represent the keyboard's layout. Schwalbach later replaced the piano-like keys with quote-unquote buttons and positioned them into four banked rows. The mechanics of the machine, however, made the alphabetical arrangement problematic. The type bars were attached to the circumference of a metal ring, forming a quote-unquote basket. When a key was pressed, the corresponding type bar would swing upwards, causing the print head to strike at the center of the ring. Gravity would then return the type bar back to its initial position. The implication of this design, however, was that pressing adjoining keys in quick succession would cause their type bars to collide and jam the machine. To mitigate this problem, keys were reordered using analysis of letter frequency and trial and error. Densmore asked his son-in-law, a Pennsylvania school superintendent, what letters and combinations of letters appeared most often in the English language. Type bars consisting to letters in commonly occurring alphabetic pairs such as S and T, were placed on opposite sides of the ring. The keyboard ultimately presented to Remington was arranged as follows. The article follows with four rows of characters that illustrate the newer keyboard arrangement. After it purchased the device, Remington made several adjustments, including switching the period and R keys so that the salesman could impress customers by typing typewriter using the keys in the top row, which created a keyboard with what is essentially the modern QWERTY layout. This subsection is accompanied by a diagram captioned, quote, type bars were attached to the circumference of a metal ring such that they would strike a common center, end quote. Section three, reception and legacy. The Scholes and Glidden was the first commercially successful typewriter. Industrialization and corporate growth in the late 19th century produced a business environment for which the device was well-suited. New communication technologies, such as the telegraph and telephone, facilitated geographic expansion and increased the speed with which business was conducted. The resulting increase in the volume of correspondence required messages to be produced quickly and legibly. Before the typewriter, clerks and copyists would, could write relatively quickly in shorthand or longhand. The comprehension of these scripts, however, required either special training or close concentration. Typesetting was used when legibility was important, but it was also a slow and expensive process. 
The typewriter succeeded because it simultaneously addressed both issues. The public was initially skeptical of the typewriter, and reactions including apathy and antagonism. Outside of large companies, letters generally did not need to be composed quickly. As the device was reliant upon its operator, it offered no automation. In business settings involving customer interaction, the unfamiliar machines were viewed with suspicion, as there existed the perception that mechanical devices could be rigged by unscrupulous merchants. And the presence of such a large object between the customer and employee interrupted the quote-unquote personal touch. Individuals receiving typewritten letters often found them insulting, as type implied they could not read handwriting, or impersonal problems exacerbated by the all uppercase writing. The typewriter also precipitated privacy concerns, as recipients of letters of a personal nature believed a third-party operator or typesetter must have been involved in their composition. The first part of this section is accompanied by a photo of shorthand writing with the caption, quote, shorthand, although capable of being written quickly, required special training to comprehend. The typewriter simultaneously addressed the need for speed and legibility, end quote. Section 3.1, Women and the Typewriter. The association of women with the typewriter may be linked to the way in which it was marketed. Before the typewriter was acquired by Remington, Scholz's daughter was employed to demonstrate the device and to appear in promotional images, which served as the basis for early advertisements. Remington sales agents later marketed the machine, with tactics including the use of attractive women to demonstrate the device at trade shows and in hotel lobbies. Depictions of female operators suggested that the device was, quote, easy enough for a woman, end quote, and suited for domestic use. Although also designed to allow Remington to maintain manufacturing efficiencies with its sewing machine division, the typewriter's aesthetics, the sewing machine stand and floor ornamentation, were further intended to facilitate its acceptance into the household. A, quote, major consequence, end quote, of the typewriter's development was the entrance of women into the clerical workforce. Although women were already employed in factories and certain service industries in the 1880s, the typewriter facilitated an influx of women into office settings. Before the Young Women's Christian Association YWCA, established the first typing school in 1881, women were trained by the manufacturer and their typing services provided to customers along with the machine. The expansion of correspondence and paperwork that demanded the efficiency of typewriters, however, also created demand for additional clerical workers. The low wages accepted by women, often 50% or less of those paid to a man, made them more attractive economically to businesses when filling the new positions. As typing and stenography positions could pay up to 10 times more than those in factories, women were attracted in large numbers to office work. In 1874, less than 4% of clerical workers in the United States were women. By 1900, the number had increased to approximately 75%. Before his death, Schultz remarked of the typewriter, quote, I do feel that I have done something for the women who have always had to work so hard. This will enable them more easily to earn a living, end quote. This subsection contains an illustration with the caption, quote, A female typist operates a Schultz and Glidden typewriter, as depicted in an 1872 Scientific American article. End quote. Section 4. See also. This section suggests several articles for further reading. The suggested articles are American Typewriter, a modern font based on the Scholes and Glidden typewriter font. Dvorak, an alternative to the QWERTY keyboard layout. Keyboard layout, arrangement of keys on a typographic keyboard. Section 5. Notes. This section contains various footnotes, references, and citations regarding the article. Section 6 and 7. Contain references used in this article and a bibliography. Section 8. Further reading. This section contains recommended books and other publications for further information. Section 9. External links. This section contains a link to Wikimedia Commons with content related to the Scholes and Glidden typewriter. We now come to the end of the spoken article, Scholes and Glidden typewriter. 
This sound file and all text in the article are licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Sharealike 3.0 Unported License, available at creativecommons.org.